In this video, I'll be running through the remaining rules of replacement, and then we'll do a few examples of using the rules. We need some rules pertaining to the horseshoe or arrow, and so the first one we're going to introduce is called transposition, or sometimes it's called contraposition, but your book calls it transposition. So if we have P only if Q, I tried to jump up and down and stress uh, that this is not the same as if Q then P. Q implies P. You can go from P to Q, that doesn't mean that you can go from Q to P. However, this is interchangeable with if not Q, then not P. This is sort of similar to our modus tollens principle, where we said that if you know P implies Q, and then you know not Q, you can conclude not P. Well, you can also say if not Q, then not P. So it's the same, uh, it's a very similar kind of idea. Another rule pertaining to conditionals is called material implication, and this tells us that P implies Q is interchangeable with either not P or else Q. Remember back when we did the truth table for uh, the conditional statement, and it turned out that when the antecedent of the conditional was false, that made the whole conditional true. And then also when the consequent of the conditional was true. That made the whole conditional statement true. So that's one way to see why the conditional statement is equivalent to saying that either the antecedent is false or the consequent is true. And the wedge statement here is also telling you that uh, what, what you will not have is P without Q. Either you don't have P at all or you get Q with P or of course you could get Q without P as well. Now yet another rule uh, pertaining to conditional statements is called exportation and this deals with the case where the consequent of your conditional statement is itself a conditional statement. So that means we have a statement of the form if P then if Q then R. And that is equivalent to if both P and Q then R. In order to process this principle uh, I wanted to come up with an example of this type of statement. It's kind of a it's kind of a strange statement form to have. I think there was an example in the homework where it was you know if if Bill O'Reilly spins the news then if Keith Overman spins back then Rachel Maddow tells it straight. Which is an odd sounding it's not a very natural sounding uh, sentence to say. One statement I can think of that has this form, but is a normal, natural sounding statement that uh, pertains to yellow light. Do you remember what you're supposed to do uh, when you come to a yellow light? I found this memorable from when I uh, took driver's ed and I always remembered it. But I get, most people don't. I always ask in class if people remember this and they usually don't. But the rule for coming to a yellow light is that you must stop if you can stop safely. Uh, stop if you can do so safely. At least that's what I was taught, you know, back in the 90s. I don't know if it, I don't know if it changed or something since then. But um, the point is that there, there's this normal kind of a statement but it has this form. If you come to a yellow light, then if you can stop safely, then you must stop. Now that seems like a, a more normal version of a, state, of a statement like this. And what we're saying is that this is equivalent to, to the statement, if you come to a yellow light and you can stop safely, then you must stop. So there's an example maybe kind of bringing home that the exportation principle. Now we don't have any rule about the uh, triple bar or double arrow. Up to here, there's absolutely, there's, there are none in the rules of implication and there are none in the rules of replacement so far. So uh, as of now, if you come to a statement with triple bar or, or the double arrow, then you're just stuck. There's nothing you can do with it. So, so we're going to have a rule called uh, material equivalence. A statement like P if and only if Q uh, asserts a kind of equivalence between P and Q, P and Q, but it isn't logical equivalent. It's not that they're they're not logically guaranteed to have the same truth value, but the statement here says that they just do in fact have the truth, same truth value. Hence the name material equivalent. And our rule is just going to tell us to unpack the triple bar statement into what we originally sort of used it as an abbreviation for that uh, P implies. Q and Q implies P. So we sort of unpack uh, this material equivalence into its two component parts. We have another principle about uh, triple bar or double arrow uh, statements. P if and only if Q can also be interchanged with either both P and Q or both of them are false, not P and not Q. Remember we saw on a truth table that uh, when you say P if and only if Q, it's, it's like saying these things have the same truth value, either both true or both false. Now we have one more uh, replacement rule in our system. It's called tautology, kind of a redundant name since all of these things are tautologies. Every single equivalence uh, rule we've given is a tautology, and the rules of implication uh, relate to tautologies as well. This one's particularly uh, tautologous sounding, though. Uh, it's If you have the statement either P or P, then that is equivalent to uh, just P. Suppose you get pulled over by a cop, and the cop says, well, I'll give you two choices. One, I could take you to jail, or I could take you to jail. Uh, which which option do you pick, right, between those two choices? It's uh, it's the same, right, either way, so, so it's equivalent to saying uh, you're going to jail, right? So P or P reduces to P. Uh, you could also expand P, you know, and, and put P or P, remember. There's another part to this tautology rule, which is if you have the state, a statement of the form P and also P, then that is equivalent to, you guessed it, P, right? Sort of like a redundancy rule. It always reminds me of that scene in Goodfellas where De Niro says to the uh, to the kid, you know, today you learn the two most important things in life. Never say nothing to nobody and always keep your mouth shut, which is basically uh, just saying the same thing twice there. Although, you know, remember in our system, uh, that kind of uh, sameness of meaning doesn't really come in 
into it. So I suppose we wouldn't represent those two statements the same way. So now we've gone through all of our rules of replacement. We've also got the rules of implication, which we went through earlier. Let's check out a couple examples of how this is to be used. Take a look at exercise 7.1 in the book here. This is a fill in the blank exercise, and we're supposed to figure out which of the first four rules of implication applies in the example, and then what conclusion do you get? So with number one here, if we have G implies F, and then we have not F, we're supposed to figure out which rule applies, modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, or hypothetical syllogism. So we take a look at our rules for comparison, and we find that modus tollens is the one that fits the form, because the main operator of the first premise is horseshoe, which is the same thing as arrow, then we have the negation of the, the consequent of our conditional, just like we have with modus tollens. And so we're supposed to conclude the negation of the antecedent. So we fill those in, that we have modus tollens, and we conclude not G, because G is the antecedent there. Uh, skipping up a bit to number five, they give us three premises or assumptions, N, either N or F, N implies K, and we have to figure out which two of those are usable as one of our rules. They're not all going to be used this time, only two are applicable. And I see we've got the ingredients for a modus uh, ponens. We got a horseshoe statement here, and then the antecedent of that conditional is premise one. So we can use those, and we can use modus ponens, and the conclusion we draw is K. Now, take a look at exercise 7.2. It's the same idea, fill in the blank. This time, they're going to give you the rule, and you figure out which line the rule applies to. And we're using the last four rules of implication. Okay, number one, we're supposed to use simplification. Simplification rule tells us we can take a conjunction, and we can assert the left uh, conjunct, the left side of the dot. The only premise th that that applies to here is the second one. That's the only one where dot is the main operator. It's got to be the main operator, by the way, Remember, that can't be a subset. So we're going to use line two, and the conclusion we get from that is uh, B. Next example asks us to use constructive dilemma. So we need a conjunction of two conditionals, and then we need a disjunction, where the disjuncts are the uh, antecedents of the two conditionals. Where do we find that? Here it is with uh, lines one and three. So the conclusion we're supposed to draw is either T or Q. The consequence of our two conditionals come down. Uh, remember, you can't use line two. How come we can't use line two? there's a wedge as the main operator instead of a dot. Okay, moving on to look at some examples from uh, part two of this exercise. They're giving you a couple of assumptions, and then you've got this intermediate line. A conclusion was drawn from lines one and two, which is then used in turn to get line four with the use of another rule. So you gotta figure out uh, what's that intermediate step. So they had G implies N, and then they had G and K. Now you gotta figure out how they get something which then leads to saying G or T. Since there's no wedge statement above, I conclude that line four, G or T, has to come from addition. That's the only way that uh, we could get a wedge statement where there wasn't one before. And that's not going to come from anything that's already up there, so this is going to come from line three. What can I get on line three that would lead to saying G or T by addition? Well, there's only one thing. I could. G. I have to have G there. So how do I get G from lines one and two? That actually it isn't very hard. Line two says G and K, so simplification tells me that I can assert the left side of the conjunct. So I can get G from line two and simplification. Uh, that's how these exercises in part two work. Fill in the blank to find the intermediate step, and then from there, get to the next step. If we look at the exercises 7.3, they start off the same way. Which of these lines can we use? The Morgans on? The answer is line two. For the Morgans, uh, we need one of these four things, and we've got the negation of a disjunction there as line two, so we can use that. We can't quite use line three, because you've, even though there is one of the de Morgans rules is a disjunction, both sides have to be negation in order for us to do anything with that with the Morgan. So line three, you don't have a negation on the right side of, um, of the wedge here. So that's not going to work. So line two is the only option. And we put in as our uh, conclusion, and the premise is telling us it's not the case that either N or G, so our conclusion is going to be not N and not G. Now, if we go to part three on any of these exercises, then uh, what they're going to do is give you a couple of assumptions, and then you have to figure out how to use the, the rules in order to get to uh, a certain conclusion. If we're given these two statements, uh, not M implies P and not N implies Q. And secondly, not, it's not the case that M and N. Can we get to the conclusion either P or Q? And now the training wheels are off and it's not filling the blank anymore. You just have to figure out how to uh, how to use the rules to get to this conclusion. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this here. When I look at the first premise, it seems to me like it's almost time for a constructive dilemma. We've got a conjunction with two conditionals on either side. And if I think in terms of what I need in order to do my constructive dilemma here, I need to get not M or not N because I need the two antecedents of the conditionals in question uh, as disjuncts. So how do I get that? That's
that's going to come from the second given assumption. If I have, it's not the case that both m and n, I can turn that into either not m or not n by um, the rule de Morgan in line two. And now I can do my constructive dilemma with uh, lines one and three. That uh, my conclusion is going to be a wedge statement, and the two sides are going to be uh, the consequence of the conditional above p on one side, q on the other side. And look at that. That was exactly what I was trying to get to. So we're all done. Now that one was easy enough. If you try some of the examples from later on, uh, they can be can be a little more tricky to try to get to this conclusion that you're trying to get to. But in any case, that's how you do uh, these uh, proof examples. So all there is to really do at this point is uh, get some practice in. And uh, we've got plenty of examples here. So certainly let me know if you're having any difficulties.